Jack and the Pirate School, Part One. Once upon a time, there was a boy called Jack. He was seven, and Jack had six sisters, but no brothers, and they were really, really girly. All day long, they'd play with their dolls and with their beauty salon, and twirl around in their pink ballet tutus. Jack thought it was really, really boring. How about a game of pirates? Jack used to say every morning when they didn't have to go to school, and sometimes his sisters would agree. But their idea of playing pirates was to sit all the rogues and ruffians and cutthroats around in a circle and serve cups of tea and slices of cake. They didn't want to make people walk the plank or hunt for buried treasure or anything. And Jack just got fed up and so went to play pirates by himself. Then one day. They were all sitting at lunch when Jack's father asked him if he wanted to go to sailing school in the summer holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah," said Jack. "That sounds great." And so it was agreed. In the summer holidays, Jack would go off to sailing school for a few days. Just one thing, Jack," said his father. "Make sure you aren't captured by any pirates." And all his sisters laughed, because they might hold you to ransom for a million pounds," said his father. "Oh, I wouldn't worry about that," said Jack. "The rascals and ruffians can never capture me. I just fight them off." And he made a slashing motion with his hands, as if he was waving a cutlass through the air. "See, like this," said Jack. "Boom, baff." And all his sisters rolled their eyes. That's agreed, then," said his father. Jack was so excited, he could hardly wait for the school term to end. All day long, he would sit at his desk at school, dreaming of how he was going to be out there on the ocean waves, and wondering if there really were any pirates out there. Not that he'd mind if there were. He wasn't frightened of pirates. Finally, the big day arrived. It was the start of the summer holidays. Jack packed his bag very carefully. He had some clothes to wear, and some sandwiches to eat, plus some swimming trunks in case he fell into the water, and a cutlass. Because, after all, you never know what kind of ruffians you're going to meet on the high seas. Of course, it was only a toy plastic cutlass, but never mind. Thought Jack, maybe he could just scare them away by waving it around a bit. He'd show 'em. His mum put him on the train and told him to be careful. And as he watched the countryside go by, Jack couldn't wait to see the ocean. Finally, he could see the waves crashing against the shore, and soon afterward, the train pulled up into the station. He climbed off the train and looked up and down the platform, and then he saw a man standing with a sign which said, "Boys who want a life on the ocean waves, please step this way." And so Jack walked towards him. "Excuse me," he said. It was at that point that he noticed a funny-looking parrot sitting on a man's shoulder. "Uh, excuse me," said Jack. "Yes, what is it?" said the man. "Is this the right place for the sailing school?" The man paused. "Ah!" scored the parrot. "Sailing school?" "Ah!" Shut up, you stupid bird," growled the man. Then he looked back at Jack. Sailing school, you could say that," he said. "Step this way, young man." 
and so Jack followed him toward the car, and they drove to the port. Who's a silly boy then? squawked the parrot, or at least he did until the man whacked him around the beak. And then they climbed out of the car, and the man showed Jack the ship. But it wasn't the ship Jack was expecting. It was more of a galleon than a yacht, with huge sails and rigging, and a crow's nest. I uh, I uh, I mean," said Jack nervously. But the man just pushed him up the stair so hard that Jack went flying across the deck. The next thing he knew, a very tall man was walking towards him, a man with a black cape and a wooden leg. He leant straight into Jack's face. "Welcome to the pirate school, young man," he boomed. "Where we'll teach you everything you need to know for a life of mayhem and treachery on the high seas." I hope you like excitement, young man, because from now on you're gonna have plenty of it. Excitement is just what I love most of all," said Jack. And then he felt a tiny bit frightened. Jack and the Pirate School, Part Two. He was lying on the deck. And Captain Blackheart was leaning over him. Welcome to the pirate school, young man. He boomed. I hope you like excitement, young man, because from now on you're gonna have plenty of it. Excitement is just what I love most of all," said Jack. And then he felt a tiny bit. Frightened, but I think I was meant to be at sailing school, not pirate school. Sailing school! Roared Captain Blackheart, and then roared with laughter. Roar! <laughs> Did you hear that, my hearties? He looked around the deck, and Jack looked around as well. And all across the deck, he could see about twenty pirates, and they were the worst, most desperate-looking ruffians he had ever seen. They wore striped vests and old shoes, and they had dirt all over their faces and hands. And as soon as Captain Blackheart laughed, they all laughed as well. Sailing school, yes, say," said Captain Blackheart. "Well, we'll teach you all you need to know right here, won't we, lads?" And all the pirates laughed even louder. Our men can unfurl the rigging with one hand, cut a man down with their cutlass with the other, and fire a broadside of cannon right into the black, cruel hearts of the enemy with their big toe. Isn't that better than sailing school? Yes, I suppose so," said Jack. Because sailing school is for girls. I wouldn't want that," said Jack. "I'd much rather learn how to be a pirate." Then let's begin, my lad," said Captain Blackheart. "And we'll make a pirate out of you before the day is done. That we will." And then he picked up Jack with both hands and hurled him across the open deck of the ship. Get yourself kitted out! Jack went hurtling back across the deck, and then fell down the stairs and went tumbling, 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 until he was lying flat out on the downstairs deck. Out! Said Jack. That hurts. 
a boy was standing right next to him. He looked about nine to Jack, and he was dressed in old rags, and his face was covered in dirt. Hurt, did it? Said the boy. It did just a bit," said Jack, climbing to his feet. Just then, the boy clipped him around the head, and Jack fell over again. "That's all right then." The boy put out a hand. "My name's Ben. I'm the cabin boy round here." He looked Jack up and down. "You can't wear that stuff," he said. "We'll get you some proper clothes." And Ben walked across to a big chest. He pushed aside a snake that just happened to be sitting on top of it, and pulled it open. "Here, take your pick," he said. Inside the chest, there was a collection of the dirtiest, oiliest, meanest-looking rags you had ever seen. Jack pulled out an old battered pair of trousers and a striped vest. And pulled them on. Then he messed up his hair a bit and spread some grime across his face. It was just the sort of thing that made his mum really cross. I'm going to enjoy being a pirate, he thought to himself. There's just one thing. I better tell mum and dad I'm not at sailing school. So he walked up onto the deck until he saw Captain Blackheart. He was standing at the wheel of the ship, with the parrot at his shoulder. Ah, Jack, my lad, he looked like a regular ruffian," said Captain Blackheart. "Thanks, sir," he said. "But I just wanted to tell my mum and dad that I'm at pirate school, not sailing school." And suddenly, Captain Blackheart looked very cross. And the whole ship went silent, so that all Jack could hear was the rustling of the wind through the sails. All the pirates were edging close towards him, until Jack was completely surrounded. We don't tell parents that anyone is at pirate school. He said, in a voice so menacing it sent a shiver down Jack's spine. And then he roared with laughter, <laughs> and all the pirates laughed with him, and even Ben was laughing, because you're a prisoner," roared Captain Blackheart. "A prisoner," said Jack. "Oh." You're not scared, are you, Jack? Said Captain Blackheart. Me scared? Said Jack, just a little nervously. Nah. Jack and the Pirate School, Part Three. Just in case you can't quite remember what happened so far, Jack was a boy of seven who went off to sailing school one summer. But there was a bit of a mix-up, and Jack found himself at pirate school instead. He'd been dressed in old rags by the cabin boy Ben, but when he asked to tell his mum and dad where he was, it turned out he'd been taken prisoner. We don't tell parents that anyone is at pirate school," said Captain Blackheart. In a voice so menacing, it sent a shiver down Jack's spine, and then he roared with laughter, and all the pirates laughed with him. Even Ben was laughing. Because you're a prisoner," roared Captain Blackheart. "A prisoner," said Jack. "Oh, you're not scared, are you, Jack?" Said Captain Blackheart. "Me, scared," said Jack, just a little nervously. "Nah." Well, that's good then, my hearty, because there's no room for scaredy cats on this pirate ship. 
And saying that, Captain Blackheart waved his rusty hook through the air. All the men on this ship have left their families behind many years ago, and they all joined us boys, the captain continued. He pointed to the rogues and ruffians lined up on the deck. How many years since you saw your family, Black Spot? An ugly-looking ruffian with a giant black spot on his face stepped forward. I reckon it'll be twenty years, Captain. How about you, one leg? A vicious-looking rascal with a stump where his leg should be stepped forward. At least fifty years, Captain, he said. And you, Razor? What about you? And a pirate with the biggest nose that Jack had ever seen stepped forward. At least a hundred years, Captain. So you see, lad, when you sign up with Captain Blackheart's pirate ship, you leave your family behind forever. But we'd all rather sail the seven seas with Captain Blackheart," cried the pirates with one voice. "And so would I," said Jack. Except he wasn't really so sure, because a hundred years at sea seemed an awfully long time. Still, never mind. He thought, "It looks like great fun." More fun than playing with his silly and soppy six sisters back at home, anyway. So how do I start being a pirate, sir? Asked Jack. Captain Blackheart scratched his chin with his rusty metal hook and thought for a moment. You could start with climbing of the rigging, he said, or we could put you on crow's nest duty. Or maybe even a small lesson in how to set up a plank, so that any dastardly village we come across can be made to walk on it. Cripes! That sounds like fun. Indeed, it does, my lad," said Captain Blackheart. Then again, we could teach you how to fire a broadside, or practice sharpening your cutlasses. Or raising the Jolly Roger," said Jack. "Ay, that and all, my lad," said the captain. "But first, your help, Bennie, make some lunch." And so Jack followed Ben down into the galley of the ship. It had been a long, long morning so far, and Jack was feeling a bit peckish. I wonder what pirates have for lunch. Thought Jack. At school, they usually had chicken or chips or spag bol, or else fish fingers and beans, and there was often ice cream and apple crumble for pudding. And Jack usually polished it all off, and his sister's lunch as well, if there was any left. I bet pirate grub is fantastic, he decided. Okay, said Ben. You get the jellied sheep's eyes. And I'll slice up the snake. Jack felt a bit queasy all of a sudden, and a lot less hungry. You do like sheep's eyes, don't you? Said Ben. And snake. Well, ah.、Uh... Or if you prefer, we can move straight on to the stewed worms, or the bug burger. Right. Ah,、uh, Jack felt his skin go a little green. I hope you're not one of those sissy landlubbers who just likes bacon and sausages and fish fingers and all that type of grub," said Ben. "Because here on the pirate ship we eat sheep's eyes and worms and bugs and everything." "Right," said Jack. "Sounds great." And so they started on lunch. They tossed the sliced worms, they chopped the bug burgers, the sheep's eyes, and the snake all into a big pot, 
and they stirred and stirred until a big stew was ready. And then they carried it up onto deck. Captain Blackheart's ship was a long way out to sea now, and Jack couldn't see any land at all. Whichever way you looked, there was just sea, sea, and more sea. And a fierce wind was starting to blow, making the ship rock from side to side. And there were big waves starting to splash across everyone. Ben put the bowl of stew down on the centre of the deck, and all the pirates lined up with their tin plates. Ben scooped out a big spoonful of stew into each one, and they gobbled it up. "Here's yours," said Ben, putting a big pile of stew on Jack's plate. It smelled horrible, like a pile of old socks and football jerseys. And as the wind blew, the ship rocked from side to side, and Jack began to feel a bit sick. Don't waste it, lad," said Captain Blackheart. Jack took one small bite, and it was the most horrible thing he had ever tasted, even worse than Granny's beef stew, and that was so bad that all his sisters had to lie down after eating it. I said, "Don't waste it, lad," said Captain Blackheart, waving his hook at Jack. Jack tried another bite, but spat it out. Is it the sheep's eyes or the sliced worm you don't like, lad? Said Captain Blackheart. I put in some shark tongue, said Ben. Maybe he doesn't like that. And at that moment, Jack felt so queasy he ran to the side of the ship and was violently sick. When he walked back. The captain was looking very serious indeed. I don't think this lad's up for a life on the ocean," he said. "I reckon we'll put him up for ransom." "For ransom!" cried Jack. "Ay, lad," said Captain Blackheart. I reckon your parents will pay a pretty penny to get you back. Better than see you walk the plank. Of Jack and the Pirate School, Part Four. Just in case you can't remember what happened so far, Jack was a boy of seven who went off to sailing school one summer, but there was a bit of a mix-up, and Jack found himself at pirate school instead. But the lunch they made was so disgusting. Jack was sick, and Captain Blackheart decided to put him up for ransom. For ransom! cried Jack. "Ay, lad," said Captain Blackheart. "I reckon your parents will pay a pretty penny to get you back. Better than see you walk the plank." Walk the plank," cried Jack. "Well, of course," said Ben, the cabin boy. "Anyone doesn't pay the ransom, we make them walk the plank. But don't worry, you won't drown. The sharks will eat you in no time." Jack felt even queasier after that. Black spot. Cried Captain Blackheart, "Bring me that parrot." Jack watched the ugly-looking pirate called Black Spot walk across the deck. On his shoulder, there was the very same parrot who he had seen at the railway station. "Walk the plank, walk the plank," squawked the parrot. "Shut, you stupid bird!" growled Black Spot. From his overcoat, Captain Blackheart pulled out a piece of parchment and a bottle of ink. He grabbed hold of the parrot, plucked out a feather, and dipped it into the ink. "Ouch! That hurt!" screeched the parrot. "One more squawk out of you, birdie, and you'll be going in the stew," 
snarled Captain Blackheart. Big meanie, what was that? I said, which stew? Shut up! Then he looked up at Ben, handed him the feather and told him to start writing. Because Ben, it turned out, was the only person on the ship who could read and write, even though he was only the cabin boy. Captain Blackheart scratched his chin with his hook and tried to think. To Jack's parents, he began, and then he looked at Ben. Are you writing this down? Yes, sir, said Ben. Very well, said Captain Blackheart. To Jack's parents. Allow me the honour of introducing myself. My name is Captain Blackheart, the meanest, cruelest black-hearted ruffian of the seven seas and the five oceans, and I am honoured, sir, to make your acquaintance. Into my possession has fallen a boy called Jack whom I believe is your son. Although you must be ashamed of the lily-livered little land rubber, and I could hardly blame you for disowning the cowardly wretch completely, on my first acquiring the said boy, my plan was to enrol Jack in my pirate school. I'd have taught him all the skills he needed for a life of mayhem, skullduggery and piracy on the high seas. And yet, on the first day here, he has been sick. He doesn't like the food and he doesn't care much for the waves either. In short, I am forced to conclude that he is nothing but a lily-livered landlubber. Therefore, I have no use for him. I will return him to you for a ransom of one million pounds, paid in gold bullion or treasure. If we have not received our money in seven days, then Jack will be forced to walk the plank. And you will never see him again. Yours in dastardly anticipation, Captain Blackheart. P.S. If you happen to have a spare treasure map, Send that as well. Have you got that, lad? He said, looking towards Ben. Indeed I have, Captain, said Ben. But, but, started Jack. Be quiet, growled Captain Blackheart. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, squawked the parrot. Silence! roared Captain Blackheart. He folded up the letter, pressed a seal of a skull and crossbones onto it, and handed it across to the parrot. Now then, deliver that to Jack's parents, you useless bird, he said. And the parrot flapped his wings and flew away. Oh no, thought Jack, as Ben led him down to the galley. What's Dad going to say when he gets that? I'm in trouble now. The wind was blowing hard and the ship was rocking from side to side. Jack lay down in the hammock in the cabin. He suddenly remembered what Dad had said to him about not being captured by pirates while he was away at pirate school. And Jack had said not to worry. He'd just fight them with his cutlasses. Oh no, thought Jack. 
Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Now they're going to make me walk the plank. And the sharks will eat me. Now it took the parrot quite a long time to fly all the way to Jack's house. That was partly because there was a storm blowing across the ocean and partly because the parrot wasn't very fast. But mainly because he kept stopping for little snacks along the way. Still, finally he got there. And when the parrot arrived, he could see Jack's six sisters and they had just organised a tea party for their dolls in the garden. The parrot dropped down to the ground with the letter in its beak and all the sisters flapped around shouting and squeaking. I'm looking for Jack's dead, said the parrot. And whilst he was at it, he grabbed a bit of the doll's cake and ate it all up. One of the little girls rushed inside shouting, Dad! Dad! There's a parrot here to see you! But Jack's dad thought it was just a joke. Eventually he came outside and saw a slightly podgy looking parrot polishing off its third helping of cake. And there was a letter at its side. He picked up the letter and started to read. He frowned and scratched his head. And then he started to laugh. It says that Jack's being captured by pirates and is being held to ransom, he said. Oh, that's just Jack with his silly pirate games, said one of his sisters. Remember, he said he'd fight them off with his plastic cutlasses, said another. You're quite right, Jack's dad decided and he sat down to write a reply. Dear Captain Blackheart, he began, I too am honoured to make your acquaintance, dear sir. My son Jack, far from being a lily-livid landlubber, is the bravest boy who ever sailed the seven seas. He assured me personally before he left that if he was captured by pirates, he would fight the rascals off with his cutlass. No force on earth can keep him prisoner, and certainly not the cowardly Captain Blackheart. Your faithful servant, Jack's dad. P.S. Your parrot has eaten all our cake. And when he was finished, he handed the letter across to the parrot. Now, take that back to the Captain Fatso Bird, he said, and don't delay. The parrot flapped its wings, but was finding it quite hard to fly on account of all the cake it had just eaten. He flew across the land and then over the seas until finally he landed on Captain Blackheart's pirate ship. Ah! cried the captain. So you've returned, my pretty bird! Let us see how soon that stupid boy's father plans to pay us our treasure. Jack was already hard at work scrubbing the floor of the ship. He watched as Captain Blackheart handed the letter to Ben because he was the only person who could read it. And Ben started to read. Dear Captain Blackheart, he began, I too am honoured to make your acquaintance, dear sir. My son Jack, far from being a lily-livered landlubber, is the bravest boy who ever sailed on the seven seas. He assured me personally before he left that if he was to be captured by pirates, he would fight the rascals off with his cutlass. Oh no, thought Jack. I was only joking. And he could see Captain Blackheart growing redder and redder and redder, as if he was about to explode. No force on earth can keep him prisoner, and certainly not the cowardly Captain Blackheart, continued Ben. 
your faithful servant, Jack's dad. There was a silence on board the ship. All the pirates were standing still, looking at the deck. And all you could hear was the rustling of the wind in the sails. Whilst Captain Blackheart turned red, then green, then purple. Prepare the plank! He roared suddenly and he looked at Jack. Your father has gravely insulted this ship, sir, he snarled. And one week from today, you will walk the plank. The Frog Prince In olden times, when if you made a wish, it would always come true, there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful. But the youngest was so beautiful that the sun itself, which has seen so much, was astonished whenever it shone in her face. Close by the king's castle lay a great dark forest, and under an old lime tree in the forest was a well. And when the day was very warm, the king's child went out into the forest and sat down by the side of the cool fountain. And when she was dull, she took a golden ball and threw it up on high and caught it. And this ball was her favourite playing thing. Now it so happened that on one occasion the princess's golden ball did not fall into the little hand which she was holding up for it, but on to the ground beyond and rolled straight into the water. The king's daughter followed it with her eyes, but it vanished, and the well was so deep that the bottom could not be seen. On this she began to cry, and cry louder and louder, and could not be comforted. And as she was complaining, someone said to her, What troubles you, king's daughter? You weep so that even a stone would show pity. She looked round to the side from whence the voice came, and saw a frog stretching forth its thick, ugly head from the water. Ah, old water splasher, is it you? said she. I am weeping for my golden ball, which has fallen into the well. Be quiet, and do not weep, answered the frog. I can help thee. But what wilt thou give me? Whatever you will have, dear frog, said she. My clothes, my pearls and jewels, and even the golden crown which I'm wearing. The frog answered, I do not care for clothes, thy pearls and jewels, or thy golden crown. But if you will love me, and let me be thy companion and playfellow, and sit by thee at thy little table, and eat off thy little golden plate, and drink out of thy little cup, and sleep in thy bed. If thou wilt promise me this, I will go down below, and bring thee thy golden ball up again. Oh yes, said she, I promise thee all you wish, if you will but bring my ball back again. She, however, thought, how silly that frog does talk. He lives in the water with the other frogs and croaks and can be no companion to any human being. But the frog, when he had received this promise, put his head into the water and sank down and in a short while came swimming up again with the ball in his mouth and threw it onto the grass. The king's daughter was delighted to see her pretty plaything once more and picked it up and ran away with it. Wait, wait, said the frog. Take me with thee. But what did it avail him to scream his croak, croak after her as loudly as he could? She did not listen to it, but ran home 
and soon forgot the poor frog, who was forced to go back into his well once more. The next day, when she had seated herself at table with the king and all the courtiers, and was eating from her little golden plate, something came creeping, splish splash, splish splash, up the marble staircase, and when it had got to the top, it knocked at the door and cried, "Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me." She ran to see who was outside. But when she opened the door, there sat the frog in front of it. Then she slammed the door to in great haste, sat down to dinner again, and was quite frightened. My child, what art thou so afraid of? Is there perchance a giant outside who wants to carry thee away? Ah,、oh, no," replied she. "It is no giant, but a disgusting frog." What does a frog want with you? Ah,、oh, dear father, yesterday, as I was in the forest sitting by the well playing, my golden ball fell into the water, and because I cried so, the frog brought it out again for me, and because he so insisted, I promised him he should be my companion, but I never thought he would be able to come out of his water. And now he is outside there, and wants to come in to me. In the meantime, it knocked a second time and cried, "Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Dost thou not know what thou said to me, yesterday by the cool waters of the fountain?" Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Then said the king, "That which you have promised, you must do. Go and let him in." She went and opened the door, and the frog hopped in and followed her step by step to her chair. There he sat and cried, "Lift me up beside you." She delayed, until at last the king commanded her to do it. When the frog was once on the chair, he wanted to be on the table, and when he was on the table, he said, "Now push your little golden plate nearer to me, that we may eat together." She did this, but it was easy to see that she did not do it willingly. The frog enjoyed what he ate. But almost every mouthful she took choked her. At length he said, "I have eaten and am satisfied. Now I am tired. Carry me into thy little room, and make thy little silken bed ready, and we will both lie down and go to sleep." The king's daughter began to cry. For she was afraid of the cold frog, which she did not like to touch, and which was now to sleep in her pretty clean little bed. But the king grew angry and said, "He who helped thee when thou wert in trouble ought not afterwards to be despised by thee." So she took hold of the frog with two fingers, carried him upstairs, and put him in the corner. But when she was in bed, he crept up to her and said, "I am tired, and want to sleep as well as thou. Lift me up, or I will tell thy father." Then she was terribly angry and took him and threw him with all her might against the wall. "Now you will be quiet, you horrible little frog," said she. But when he fell down, he was no frog. But a king's son with beautiful, kind eyes. He, by her father's will, was now her dear companion and husband. Then he told her how he had been bewitched by a wicked witch, and how no one could have delivered him from the well but herself, and that tomorrow they would go together to his kingdom. Then they went to sleep. And next morning, when the sun awoke them, 
a carriage came driving up with eight white horses, which had white ostrich feathers on their heads and were harnessed with golden chains. And behind stood the young king's servant, faithful Henry. Faithful Henry had been so unhappy when his master was changed into a frog, that he had caused three iron bands to be laid round his heart, in case it should burst with grief and sadness. The carriage was to conduct the young king into his kingdom. Faithful Henry helped them both in, and placed himself behind again, and was full of joy because of this wonderful end to their troubles. And when they had driven a part of the way, the king's son heard a cracking behind him as if something had broken. So he turned round and cried, Henry, the carriage is breaking. No, master, it is not the carriage. It is a band from my heart, which was put there in my great pain when you were a frog and imprisoned in the well. Again and once again, while they were on their way, something cracked, and each time the king's son thought the carriage was breaking. But it was only the bands which were springing from the heart of the faithful Henry, because his master was set free and was happy. Tick Tock Turkey and the Mysterious Egg On a sunny but rather cool morning on Egg Island, Tick Tock Turkey was thinking about food as usual. He flapped up and down the beach, squawking and muttering, and looking crossly at the sundial, where the long, thin shadow of a stone egg pointed out the time. Not far away, in the pleasant shade of a gently curving palm tree, Future Dog quietly got on with her morning yoga, carefully balancing on her hind legs and tail, breathing deeply. I can't believe it's only an hour since breakfast, said Tick Tock Turkey. I'm so hungry. I know that can't be the real time. My tummy says it's definitely lunch time, so that stupid sundial must be broken. Future Dog, who was very familiar with Tick Tock Turkey's impatience, laughed. Are you laughing at me? squawked Tick Tock Turkey. The cheek! I'm about to starve to death because of a broken sundial, and you think it's funny. I'm not laughing because you're hungry. Future Dog peered over her sunglasses. Starving is never a laughing matter. Not when it's real, anyway. I laugh because the sundial can't be broken. Tick Tock Turkey flapped his feathers. What do you mean? That sundial is slow. It's not working. It's wound down. Someone needs to wind it up. In fact, I don't remember anyone winding it up, ever. Or changing the battery or anything. Future Dog eased into her next yoga position. She balanced on her head with her legs stretched out wide, her tail wagging elegantly from side to side. Tick-tock, turkey... She said calmly, Do you know how a sundial works? Tick Tock Turkey gobbled a little offendedly. Do I know how a sundial works? Do I? Well, everyone knows how a sundial works, don't they? The big dark hand points to the time, it goes round, and you know what time it is. And that is how a sundial works. Future Dog carefully lowered herself from her headstand, stood up, let out a deep breath and said, Tick Tock Turkey, the sun is bright and makes the shadow. The sun moves through the sky as the world turns round and the shadow points to different places as the day goes on. 
It doesn't need to be wound up. It doesn't need a battery and it works as long as the sun keeps on rising and setting and moving across the sky. And that's it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have yoga to do. And with that, Future Dog rolled up her yoga mat and walked away up the beach. All right, keep your fur on, said TikTok Turkey. I know about the sun. Everybody knows about the sun. And if this sundial is so brilliant, then how come it stops working in cloudy weather? It's a cheap one if you ask me. If Egg Island ever floats past a clock shop, we should get a new one. Future Dog paused for a moment, as if she was about to say something, but then carried on walking. She found a shady spot beneath a big turkey statue and rolled her yoga mat in the sand and carried on with her exercises. All right, said TikTok Turkey to himself. So it's not lunchtime yet. And it's only an hour after breakfast, so it's too early for brunch. No bother, I'll have lunch fast. It's never too early for lunch fast. Tick-tock Turkey scratched his tummy feathers with his wing and licked his beak with his tongue. What do I fancy to eat? Hmm, worms. Well... I had worms for breakfast, so that wouldn't do. It's not on to have the same meal twice. But I love worms so much. Hang on, those were earthworms that I ate earlier. There's nothing stopping me having a different kind of worm for lunch fast. How about sea worms? Yes, I haven't had sea worms for ages. That'll do nicely. Tick-tock Turkey scrambled up the beach to his small nest by the edge of the jungle, pulled on his swimming trunks and ran back down to the shore, gobbling and squawking excitedly at the thought of all those delicious salty sea worms. He was just about to dive into the frothy waves when he remembered something. Oh yes, he said, I mustn't go swimming with a time watch on. He unbuckled the strap of his time-travelling watch and placed it carefully on a stone in the sand. Future Dog says it's not waterproof. She'd go mad if it got broken. Broken like that stupid sundial! <laughs> Tick-tock Turkey chuckled, but not too loud. He didn't want to spoil grumpy Future Dog's yoga. I should be careful anyway, he said. After all, it is the only time watch in the world. Then Tick Tock Turkey took a deep breath and dived in. He gave an enormous squawk and jumped straight back out onto the beach. He stood there, his eyes popping out of his head, shivering, clicking his beak with his feathers dripping cold seawater onto the hot sand. What? What? What the egg? He gobbled. It's freezing! Future Dog heard TikTok Turkey's cries right across the beach, and she casually strolled down to see what he was up to. F -f 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 Future Dog! said TikTok Turkey his beak looking a little bluer than usual. What is so c cold? I've never known it so c cold. Hmm, said Future Dog. I think Egg Island might be drifting southwards. Now, we're already quite far south, if I remember correctly. So that would bring us into much colder water. That must be it. Future Dog looked out to sea and squinted through her sunglasses. It also explains all those penguins swimming out there. 
she pointed to a few cheerful penguins splashing and diving not far from the beach. One of them was sitting on a little block of ice that floated in the water. Penguins, said Tick Tock Turkey with a frown. I didn't spot them before. One of the penguins bobbed to the surface and waved. Hey there, she called. Welcome to the south. You two should come and try some of these sea worms. They're delicious. Tick Tock Turkey was furious. That is so not fair, he huffed. Stupid penguins with their stupid warm coats that let them swim in freezing water. I hope the sea worms make them sick. That's not nice, said Future Dog. You know, Tick Tock Turkey, I went for a swim this morning before I started my yoga, and the water was lovely and warm then. We must have been much closer to the equator. It isn't the penguin's fault you missed out. And you know what they say? The early bird catches the sea worm. She smiled. Very funny, said Tick Tock Turkey. But I'm not having it. I'm not letting them have all the food. I'm not going to swim in cold water either. What to do? He scratched his head. There's nothing for it. He raised one wing high in the air. I'm going to use the time watch. Here we go again, said Future Dog. That's right, said Tick Tock Turkey. I'm going to go back in time to when the water was still warm and I'm going to gobble up all the salty sea worms I can find before those pesky penguins turned up. Future Dog sighed. Very well. I suppose a turkey's got to do what a turkey's got to do. Just be careful. I'm going to play tennis with Blobbert, so I won't be around to help you if you get into trouble. Tick Tock Turkey squawked. Trouble? It'll be easy peasy. And you're playing tennis with Blobbert? He's just a blob. He can't play tennis. I'm giving him lessons, said Future Dog. Anyway, just use the time watch carefully. Don't get it wet. We'll see you later for lunch. Don't hold your breath, said Tick Tock Turkey, fastening the watch on his wing. I plan to have so much lunch fast, I won't be needing lunch. Not tea either, or dinner, or pudding, or supper, or even bedtime bickies. I'm going to stuff myself enough for the whole day. As Future Dog wandered off to find Blobbit for their tennis lesson, she heard behind her a very loud whoosh. There went Tick Tock Turkey, zooming into the past in search of a feast. And Future Dog had seen it all before. Later that day, after the tennis lesson, after lunch, when Blobbit had blobbed off somewhere else to do whatever it is that blobs do, Tick Tock Turkey was nowhere to be seen or heard. Future Dog was worried. It seemed that Tick Tock Turkey had gone into the past and not come back. Oh dear, she said. I shouldn't have left him on his own. She felt sorry that she had laughed at him. But then he was a very silly bird. And now he could be stuck in the past. Perhaps forever. Future Dog hurried down to the seashore where she had last seen Tick Tock Turkey. There was no sign of him. She shuddered. Poor Tick Tock Turkey could be anywhere and any time. 
If he was too clumsy with the time watch, he could have gone back much too far. He could be in a prehistoric world being frightened by dinosaurs. Or, in his excitement, he could have wound the watch the wrong way altogether and ended up far in the future. Future Dog knew all about the future. But poor TikTok Turkey wouldn't have a clue. The penguins were still splashing around in the cold sea, gobbling up their sea worms and performing trick dives off their miniature icebergs. Help! called Future Dog. Did any of you see my friend earlier? The turkey! One of the penguins swam into the beach and waddled up the sand. Hello, I'm Jen, she said. The turkey, did you say? You mean that scruffy-looking bird? Oh, sure. He fiddled around with a watch and then he vanished. Whoosh! Into thin air, just like that. We all thought it's the weirdest thing. And he didn't come back, asked Future Dog. Nah-ha, said Jen Penguin, flapping her flippery wings. He never did. Oh, no said Future Dog. But we found this, said Jen. She stood aside to show a large white egg nestled in the sand. It's an egg. We've been playing wing ball with it in the water. It's not a penguin's egg. It's the wrong shape. I think it's an octopus's egg. Len Penguin over there thinks it's a snake egg and Sven Penguin thinks it's a dog egg. What do you think? Future Dog looked at the egg. It was quite fresh. It's certainly not a dog egg, thank you very much. We don't lay eggs. But where could it have come from? Beats me, said Jen. It wasn't there, and then it was there. Weird. That is strange, said Future Dog. Ah, ha! said Jen. Just like the turkey was there and then he wasn't there. Weird. Hmm, said Future Dog, thinking very hard. It's just like that old question, said Jen. You know, what came first, the bird or the egg? Yes, said Future Dog. It's just like that. And in this case, the bird definitely came before the egg. Well, said Jen, I don't suppose you know about this, being a dog, but for us penguins, eggs and birds and eggs and birds tend to come one after another. I suppose that makes sense, said Future Dog. But I can't worry about the egg now. I need to find a way to get TikTok Turkey back. I can't tell you how it all started, continued Jen, quite ignoring Future Dog's concern. I mean, the very first bird or the very first egg. But from what my mum says, I know it began as an egg, you know, when I was little. Eggs, said Future Dog. That's it. She slapped her forehead with her paw. I think I know what happened. Jen Penguin flapped her flippers. Go on, tell! Turkeys start as eggs, just like penguins, said Future Dog. I thought my friend TikTok Turkey had gone back in time to this morning to eat sea worms and never came back. And then this egg had appeared from nowhere. My conclusion is that TikTok Turkey never left. Nonsense, said the penguin. You're talking rubbish. This is why we penguins stay on the ice. Too much hot sun has driven you bonkers and you've gone dotty. Just bear with me, said Future Dog. This sort of thing happens all the time round here. As I was saying, TikTok Turkey never left. He must have turned himself back into an egg.
she pointed at the mysterious egg. That is Tick Tock Turkey before he was a chick. He hasn't even hatched. Jen Penguin squinted at the egg, unconvinced. Sounds daft to me, she said. But just say it is true. Then your turkey is going to have to grow up into a full-grown bird all over again. What drag! Tick-tock turkey is trouble enough, said Future Dog. I can't even imagine what bother a little chick-tock turkey could cause. Oh no! Poor Tick-tock turkey is back in his egg and it's all my fault. I never should have given him that watch in the first place. While they had been talking, the sun had been shining brightly on the egg in the sand. It had been getting warmer and warmer. Then there was a quiet tap. Then again, tap, tap, and again, tap, tap, tap. The tap, tapping so gentle at first, became louder and louder. Future Dog and Jen Penguin leaned in closely. They saw a small crack appearing in the egg. The crack got longer and split into two cracks and then three until finally the shell chipped open and a tiny yellow beak poked through the hole. The beak tapped at the edges of the hole and at last the shell cracked open. A very fluffy little turkey chick popped out onto the sand, chirping with a tiny voice. It's a boy! <gasps> laughed Jen. Future Dog looked down at Chick Tock Turkey and shook her head. Dear me! She said, Chick Tock Turkey waddled happily along the sand and pecked at Future Dog's leg. I think he likes you, said Jen. But he's just a baby, said Future Dog. What a disaster! What's that? Jen pointed her flipper to something lying in the broken eggshell. Future Dog could just make out a red strap and the dial of a watch. She barked in relief. Oh, thank goodness! It's the time watch! We'll have this fixed in no time! Future Dog took the time watch, fiddled with a button and quickly strapped it onto Chick Tock Turkey's little wing. He must have put it on the wrong wing after his swim. That makes it work the other way. Instead of travelling back in time, he made himself go backwards. Now keep clear. This is going to be noisy. Suddenly, a cloud of sparks and light fizzed around the chick. There was a gust of wind and feathers, and then a very loud swoosh. And there stood Tick Tock Turkey. Utterly befuddled. What? He squawked. What happened? Where did I go? I dreamed I was inside a little warm room. Then it started bouncing around. Then there was a little crack of light. Then I was in an enormous sunny desert. And you, future dog, you were twenty feet tall, and there was a giant penguin, and other giant penguins swimming, and an enormous iceberg, fifty feet high. What time is it? Where's my lunch fast? My head. Oh, I'm so confused. I'll explain it later, said Future Dog. I think you're going to need a few more lessons on how to use this time watch. I was in such a hurry to get my sea worms, said Tick Tock Turkey. 
I think I might have put it on the wrong wing. Well, it's good to have you back, said Future Dog. Even though you never left, said Jen Penguin. Who are you? Squawked Tick Tock Turkey. Tick Tock Turkey and the Chocolate Tree Wherever you go in the world, or wherever you are in the future or the past, not to mention the present, the number one food on everyone's list is chocolate. White, dark, milky, with nuts, with caramel, any way you like it, chocolate is the best. And Egg Island is fortunate enough to have the world's only chocolate tree. It's made out of solid chocolate, with hot chocolate sauce in its centre, and it grows chocolate fruit all year round, as long as it has plenty of sun and shade and water. Tick-tock Turkey had spent the best part of the day in the jungle, steadily gobbling his way through all of the chocolatey bits and pieces beneath the chocolate tree. He'd started with the juicy chocolate berries, which were so big and swollen with sugary goodness that they had fallen like chestnuts to the ground. Once they were all gone, he'd set about eating all of the chocolate leaves that had dried and curled in the sun before wafting gently on the breeze to fall in the shade of the tree. When they were finished, he munched the chocolate twigs that lay strewn about on the jungle floor. The chocolate twigs didn't taste anywhere near as nice as the berries or the leaves. The twigs were dry and bitter, but they were still chocolate. Tick-tock Turkey decided they shouldn't be wasted. Besides, he wasn't full yet. After a long time and a considerable amount of gobbling, Tick-tock Turkey sat heavily at the bottom of the tree. His belly was packed with chocolate and his beak and wings were covered in brown chocolate sauce. Oh dear, he said rubbing his tummy. I feel queasy now. I must be full up. Future Dog says it's important to eat enough but never too much. I should stop for a rest to let the food go down. He lay back in the sun and licked some chocolate from his beak. OK, that's enough rest. On with the chocolate. Tick-tock Turkey jumped to his feet and looked eagerly around him. Oh, no, he said. It can't all be gone. He strutted around the chocolate tree, looking hard at the ground for more chocolate bits. There must be something. A little bit of a chocolate berry, a, a twig, a leaf. Maybe a bit of bark that's fallen off. But there was nothing more to eat. Tick-tock Turkey sighed and shrugged. Then his eyes wandered up to the chocolate tree. There had been plenty of rain and sun in the past few days, and the tree had a decent crop of chocolate berries and even some big stripy chocolate banana matoes hanging from its branches. Tick-tock Turkey's eyes grew large and his tongue wagged. They look so juicy and sweet, he said. But Future Dog told me off of picking things straight from the tree. She said if I keep on taking chocolate sauce from the trunk for my sandwiches and eating all the fruit without letting some fall to the ground, that eventually the chocolate tree won't grow anymore and there'll be no chocolate on Egg Island ever. And that wouldn't do. He looked sadly at the tree. But I'm so hungry. <laughs> In fact, if I don't eat something soon, I might faint or get sick. And no one would want that. I'm sorry, Mr. Chocolate Tree, but this is a medical emergency and I need some banana martos right now. Doctor's orders. With a loud flap of his wings and a flurry of feathers, Tick-Tock Turkey hopped into the branches and started gobbling the fruit. 
He stuffed a few berries into his beak and then got to work on a particularly large banana mato. Tick tock turkey came an angry voice from below. What are you doing? Tick tock turkey froze. It was future dog, and she looked absolutely furious. Tick tock turkey hopped down from the tree and hung his head. I was just um checking how the fruit was getting on. They're growing very well. Were you now? Said future dog. And how do you explain all that chocolate on your beak, and that half-eaten banana mato you're hiding behind your back? Oh, future dog," said Tick Tock Turkey. "I was just so hungry. I felt ill, and I had to have a tiny nibble. It won't do any harm." Future dog folded her paws crossly. Tick tock, turkey. You probably felt ill because you've eaten too much. What did I tell you about the chocolate tree? It's very precious, and you have to be extremely careful with it. I'm sorry," said Tick tock, turkey. "I won't do it again." But it's just so tasty, and that's why it's so special," said Future Dog. Now let's go down to the beach, and maybe you can get some exercise and work off some of that fatty chocolate. Exercise," said Tick Tock Turkey. "Boring." What's that you've got in your hand? Future dog held up a small musical instrument with strings. This is a banjo. I'm teaching Blobbert how to play. Blobbert. Sniffed Tick Tock Turkey. That stupid Blob. Don't be rude about people who aren't here," said Future dog. Blobbert is actually a very good player. Fair enough," said Tick Tock Turkey. "But I can't imagine how he plucks the strings with those blobby fingers." "That's enough," said Future Dog. "I'm going to play volleyball. If you aren't coming, then at least try to stay out of trouble. And no more chocolate today." Future dog strolled off through the jungle towards the beach. Tick tock turkey watched her go. And then Tick tock turkey did something very naughty. If I can't eat any more chocolate today, he said, then I can eat some more chocolate yesterday. There's nothing for it. I'm going to use the time watch. He fiddled with a button on his watch. There was a fizz and a sizzle of sparkling lights around him, and a loud whoosh, and everything was still again. Tick tock turkey looked around. The jungle appeared more or less as it should. The trees were the same, although perhaps a little smaller. He could see Egg Mountain very clearly in the middle of the island, tall and grey against the cloudy sky. The view of the mountain wasn't usually so clear. He could also see a big turkey statue nearby. This statue was usually covered in moss and vines, but now it looked clean and bright and new. Its edges were sharp. He could hear strange drum beating somewhere in the jungle. Very odd, he said with a shiver. Anyway, let's have some of those delicious banana matoes. But the chocolate tree wasn't there. There was a big gap in the jungle where the tree should be. 
What? said Tick Tock Turkey. Where's it gone? It's such a huge tree, and it was just there now. I mean, it was there tomorrow, when, I mean, when, when I was just what? The tree was nowhere to be seen. Tick Tock Turkey waddled up to the exact spot where the trunk of the chocolate tree used to sprout from the earth. He peered down, squinting and poking at the ground with his feet. Where could it be? He said. Tick Tock Turkey noticed something peeping through the soil. It was a tiny brown shoot. He sniffed it. Definitely chocolatey. He pulled up the shoot with his beak. And gradually out came a long, thick, sugary chocolate root. By the time it was all the way off the ground, it was as tall as Tick Tock Turkey himself. Eureka! cried Tick Tock Turkey. He took a bite. It was quite simply the sweetest, chocolatiest, most delicious thing he had ever eaten. I'm in chocolate heaven. He said, and with a few enormous gobbles, he finished the root. He let out an enormous burp. That was spectacular, he said, patting his swollen tummy. I better get back before Future Dog misses me. He fiddled with the time watch again. I'll try to go back to just after I left. And then no one will suspect a thing. He pushed the button, and then, with a loud swoosh, he was back in the jungle clearing of today. What have you been doing? Asked Future Dog, who was standing there waiting, tapping her paw on the ground. Oh, hello," said Tick Tock Turkey, taken aback. I was just um trying out the time watch. I think I've got the hang of it now. Thank you. Well," said Future Dog, "I came back to check on you, and I was very surprised to see what was happening to the chocolate tree. I didn't do anything," gobbled Tick Tock Turkey. "You said no more chocolate today, and I haven't had any more chocolate today." I didn't touch the chocolate tree again today. Future Dog shook her head. Then how do you explain that? And she pointed to the tree. That is, Future Dog pointed to where the tree should have been, but there was no tree there. Not again," said Tick Tock Turkey. It's got a habit of doing that. Oh, Tick Tock Turkey," sighed Future Dog. "What have you done?" Tick Tock Turkey flapped his wings and gobbled his story in a rush. "You said no more chocolate today, but you never said no more chocolate yesterday. So I went back in time to yesterday to have a bit more chocolate, but there was no chocolate tree there, so I ate the chocolate root instead. And then I came forward in time today, and there's no chocolate tree here either." He took a deep breath. "So I don't see how it's my fault." "We all love chocolate." Said Future Dog. But you want to have it all to yourself. That way, everyone misses out in the end, even you. Now show me exactly what you did with the watch, and let's see if we can tidy up this mess. Otherwise, there'll never be any chocolate on Egg Island ever again. No one would have any chocolate ever again. Cried Tick Tock Turkey. I never meant for that. I just wanted a bit of chocolate for myself. <gasps> Future Dog, we've got to save the tree. He held up the time watch. I wound the watch back to here yesterday. That's about right, isn't it? Future Dog looked at the watch dial. 
and then slapped her forehead with her paw. Tick-tock turkey! You went back hundreds of years to when Egg Island was still a part of the land of Turkey-topia. Gosh! said Tick-tock turkey. That explains why everything looked so different. The root you ate must have been the root of the one and only chocolate tree when it was just a sapling. So that's why it tasted so incredibly delicious. He licked his beak at the memory. Future dog frowned. Sorry, said Tick-Tock Turkey. I'm very sorry that I ate it. OK, said Future Dog. So we need to get back a few moments earlier than you did last time and stop you before you eat the root. Tick-Tock Turkey flapped his wings. Eh? We... Oh, that is... You and me are going to go back in time and stop me... Oh... Oh, my head is hurting. That is so confusing. Come on, said Future Dog. She fiddled with a button on the time watch, grabbed hold of Tick-Tock Turkey's wing, and with a whoosh, they were in the ancient land of Turkey-topia. Wow, said Tick-Tock Turkey. I should pop round for tea. Oh, no, that would cause all kinds of confusion, said Future Dog. And things are confused enough already today. After all, you're about to meet yourself. There was another loud whoosh. And there, stepping out of a cloud of sparks nearby, was another Tick-Tock Turkey. What? said Tick-Tock Turkey. What? said the other Tick-Tock Turkey. This should be interesting, said Future Dog. What the egg do you think you are? said the other Tick-Tock Turkey. I'm Tick-Tock Turkey, you silly bird, said Tick-Tock Turkey. You're having a laugh, said the other Tick-Tock Turkey. Tell him, Future Dog. I'm staying out of this, said Future Dog. You're too scruffy to be me, said Tick-Tock Turkey. And you're too silly to be me, said the other Tick-Tock Turkey. This is doing my head in. What are you doing here, said Tick-Tock Turkey. You haven't come to steal some chocolate by any chance. Oh, this is too weird said the other Tick-Tock Turkey. I'm having a nasty dream from too much chocolate. I won't be doing that again. I'm off. And with that, the other Tick-Tock Turkey pushed the button on his time watch and vanished with a loud swoosh. I thought that would sort itself out, said Future Dog. Well done, Tick-Tock Turkey. Hmm, thanks, said Tick-Tock Turkey. That was the strangest thing that's ever happened. Yes, it was rather strange, said Future Dog. I don't understand how that other me was so scruffy and silly. And rude. I'm not like that at all. Hmm, said Future Dog. And where's he gone? asked Tick-Tock Turkey. I don't like to think that there's another me out there. What if I bump into me again? It's so confusing. Yes, it is rather complicated. But I wouldn't worry about it right now. Let's go back to where we started and see if the chocolate tree is all right. Okey doke said Tick-Tock Turkey, still a little puzzled.
Future Dog pushed the button on the time watch and held tightly onto Tick Tock Turkey's wing. With a swoosh, they found themselves back in the jungle clearing of today. Vines and moss covered the ancient turkey statue, and there in front of them, the chocolate trees stood, tall and brown, laden with banana matoes and berries, looking healthier and taller than ever before. Well, said Future Dog, that's a good result. The tree looks wonderful. Yes, it does. Said Tick Tock Turkey, big and delicious. Let's eat some chocolate to celebrate. Oh dear," said Future Dog. "Haven't you learned your lesson? Lighten up, misery guts," said Tick Tock Turkey. "It was a joke. There'd never be any fun around here if it wasn't for me." The one and only Tick Tock Turkey. That's true," said Future Dog. "The one and only Tick Tock Turkey. Apart from the other Tick Tock Turkey." Tick Tock Turkey shook his head. "That stupid bird," 